Welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you are here this morning and that we get to be here to worship the Lord. And you know, we, uh, Heath and I were, were just chatting a little bit about worship and, um, you know, we're going to be looking at that this morning in Psalms, but uh, there, it's a subject of, um, of true blessing to be able to gather to worship the Lord. And, you know, that has deep effects and um, impacts on each of us as well. So as we turn our attention to the Lord, as we raise our perspective and look to him and to declare his worth and his praises and to sing and to rejoice together, let's open with a quick word of prayer and then we'll begin with our worship and song this morning. Let's pray. Father, we gather this morning for the purpose of worshiping you, of, of drawing near to you, Lord, we ask that you would draw our gaze, our eyes, our focus onto you, off of ourselves and others and circumstances and issues and problems, and Lord, may we relax this morning. May we draw near to you, draw near to the God who is personal. Thank you, Lord, that we can know you, that we can know about you, but we can also know you. Lord, I pray that you would bless our worship service and all of its components this morning, and at this time, as we get to extol your value and worth and greatness in song, Lord, may you be honored and glorified, and may we be uplifted through this. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please stand. Please remain standing for our scripture reading this morning. It comes from Psalm 123. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he is gracious to us. Be gracious to us, O Lord, be gracious to us, for we are greatly filled with contempt. Our soul is greatly filled with the scoffing of those who are at ease and with the contempt of the proud. Amen. Please have a seat. Well, this morning we're going to turn our attention once again to Psalms and our special series this summer on the Songs of Ascent, Psalm 120 through 134. And this morning we're going to focus on Psalm 123, it's a shorter one. Um, and just to kind of review briefly, last time we looked at Psalm 122. A wonderful song, uh, psalm, and it is described as a song of a sense that that introduction, that um, that preceding statement, that header, I guess we could say, um, precedes all of these psalms here in in this portion we've been looking at. A psalm, a song of a sense, and then last time it adds of David. We know that David was the one who was writing this one from his own personal perspective as one living and dwelling in Jerusalem. And on this occasion, observing people pouring into the city for the, one of these um, annual pilgrimage festivals. As we looked at Psalm 122 last time, we looked at verse 1 where David says, I rejoice. Whenever they say to me, let's go to the house of Jehovah, we see David's excitement coming through in that passage. Verse 2, our feet are literally standing at your gates, O Jerusalem. So David says, I'm already here. I'm, I'm in Jerusalem. I'm ready. I'm ready to go to the house of the Lord, the temple. In verse 3, Jerusalem has been built as a city that is bound firmly together. It's been closely knit. The city is um, well-engineered, well-constructed. It's wedged within its terrain. It's compact. It doesn't have all these sprawling suburbs. And it has been built in such a way as to easily accommodate a dense population, which would be the case normally for Jerusalem, but even more so during these annual feasts. There would be people pouring in from all over the region. And the population could swell and the city could handle it. It had access to water. Uh, there was water readily available in the city. Um, it had the, the accommodations that could take care of a large population in every way. 
So David is extolling the fine design of the city, how it's compact. And then verse 4, he says, That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of Jehovah, an ordinance for Israel to extol and magnify the name of Jehovah. So he's in admiring the city. It reminds him of the people who are pouring into the city, that they're his own people from various tribes, they're his, his countrymen, and that they're coming for the reason that they have been um, instructed, required to do so by the Lord, and for the purpose of not just, you know, hopefully, going about the motions, doing what's required of them, doing the minimum, but because they rejoice and they recognize that this is their opportunity to set aside this time expressly for the purpose of extolling or magnifying the name of Jehovah. And, you know, to that extent, I think that is what biblically sets our faith apart from religions of various kinds, is that we um, are making a point of extolling the Lord, of worshiping Him, of declaring His greatness, of recognizing our need for Him, of um, speaking to that personal relationship we have with him, of the fact that he's a personal God, and we could go on and on and on and on, um, we don't maybe, you know, bring things to the Lord, uh, do things for him, you know, for, as one would do for pagan gods in order to try to get something in return. Well, you know, if I just do this, I'm going to get my the the favor of the gods if i just do enough of this then he's gonna you know give me prosperity and this and that and make my life easy we we don't approach it from that standpoint and as as such that's david's heart he's a man after god's own heart he loves to worship god and this is again written from his perspective and he reflects on the weighty responsibility given to him. He considers all these people. He's the king. He's responsible. And he notes his responsibility for taking care of the nation. In verse 5, for that is where sit the thrones in judgment, the thrones of the house of David. He says, um, I'm responsible and my household is responsible for carrying out justice, providing justice in this nation. Verse 6, he instructs this way, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Um, May they experience prosperity who love you. David recognizes the natural outflow of the implementation of justice being peace and prosperity for the, the citizens of that nation. Finally, as we... Um, Look down to verse 7. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. Verse 8. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say peace be among you. David's heart was not for violence in the streets and rioting and um, tumultuous conditions. Um, So many times that's what happens with bad leadership. They enrich themselves at the expense of the population, but that was not David. He was a good ruler and a man after God's own heart. Finally, in verse 9, because of the house of Jehovah our God, I will seek your thriving. He was intent on seeing these three things, verses 7 and verse 9, shalom, shalva, peace, prosperity, and now tov, good, goodness, thriving, we could probably say, among the nation. In, In all of this, we see in David a heart that sought after the Lord, a heart of praise, as we noted at the end last time. And that takes us directly into our psalm this morning, Psalm 123. And with all of these, again, we're invited to taste and see that the Lord is good. A song of ascents. You know, I was thinking about um, this, this concept this morning of of coming and, and drawing near to the Lord and, and worshiping Him. And um, this psalm is wonderful in that I think that it gives exactly what we need. It gives us the remedy for so many times 
and I don't know if, if you've ever felt this way, but um, you know, Sunday mornings come around and um, sometimes things go smoothly, but other times things just seem to go haywire. <laughs> they just seem to fall apart. Um, I, I can recall a time when we were living in Kansas City, and maybe some of you have heard me tell this story before. We're, we're driving on the way to church. I think Holly was at home. She had a nursing baby, and, and so it was me and Madeline and Aubrey, and just get them dressed, just get them fed, get out the door. We're driving to church, get about halfway there, and poor Aubrey, uh, she, she starts throwing up in her car seat. I was like, oh, now what do I do? So I pull over. There was a truck stop and, you know, start washing her dress, and, you know, she's unhappy, and I'm like, okay, this is just not going to work. So by the time I got her all cleaned up, church was like halfway over. I'm like, okay, we're just, we're just going to go home. <laughs> this isn't going to happen this morning. Um, maybe that's an extreme example. Uh, one example for me this morning is uh, I went to uh, Hole Punch, my, my sermon notes, and I grabbed my, my three-hole punch, and for whatever reason, maybe I hadn't emptied it in a long time, but the little bottom rubber container fell off. And so now my office is like confetti with those little round white paper things that I'm going to have to clean up at some point. Um, and so you're just like, oh, seriously, why? Um, you know, but whatever it is, whatever is, um, you know, maybe creating a hardship for you or it's serious things weighing on you, going on in your life or just things that make you frazzled or whatever, um, the important thing is to come and to draw near to the Lord. And that's what these psalms are all about, is people coming, whatever the circumstances of their life, they've got sick kids at home, they've had a rough week in business, whatever, they're drawing near. They're taking time out of their yearly schedule, setting aside time expressly to come to Jerusalem, to come to gather to come to the temple, to worship God. So let's get into these. They begin, uh, like the others, with this um, header, a song of ascents. These were what the people would sing as they were making this journey up to Jerusalem. Last time, we, we see it from the standpoint of them arriving in Jerusalem, written from one who lives in Jerusalem, David. And now we're going to see this continue um, in this same way, in that um, now the focus is on what do you do when you get there? What do you do when you're in Jerusalem while well, you turn your attention to worship? And so the psalm begins in a similar way to Psalm 121. Unto you I lift up my eyes. Remember Psalm 121, it says, um, I lift my eyes to the heavens. It's from there that my help comes from. But now, you know, walking among the mountains, that's where the psalmist's attention was drawn um, to the God who um, dwells, at least for his his earthly um, place of worship, in the temple. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. The, The presence and glory of the Lord resided at that time. And and so it, the, the hills remind him, it draws his attention upward. But now, unto you I lift my eyes. And it's interesting to begin with a pronoun, because normally in normal language you begin with the proper name, you establish who you're talking about, and then the pronoun follows. But in the poetic way that this was written, this was written on purpose, unto you, well, who is you? Well, let's find out. I lift my eyes. And then we're going to get a little more information. Oh, you who dwell in the heavens. So he goes beyond the place where the Ark of the Covenant resides to the actual dwelling place of God as being over and above. The psalmist describes lifting his eyes up even higher than the mountains to the God of heaven. Derek Kidner says his words soaring above his circumstances set his troubles in a context large enough to contain them. God is, it has been said, our ultimate refuge. So trouble is coming in this psalm, and the psalmist is going to get to that, but it's interesting, he begins by framing it with the one who is over and above and in charge. The psalmist finds help 
and hope in the transcendence and supremacy of God. And I hope that that's our heart as well, that that's what sets our minds at ease right from the beginning. We know who God is. We know where our help comes from. This, I think, is powerful also, and it was wonderful that we sang about this this morning. When you think of the Lord's Prayer, right, you think of Matthew. And the, Jesus is asked by his disciples, um, Lord, can you teach us how to pray? And so it's been called the Lord's Prayer because Jesus is the one who um, delivered the words, but it's actually, we could say it's the disciples' prayer because he was actually teaching his disciples how to pray, and I think that there's so much richness in that. And it's picking up things from the Old Testament. So our Father who art in heaven may very well be drawing right here on this verse from this psalm. Unto you I lift my eyes, you who dwell in the heavens. And I believe that as that Lord's Prayer, that disciples' prayer goes on, it's picking up things concepts from throughout the Old Testament and tying them together. It's reminding people of the things that they've read, the things that they've studied, the things that they know, and packaging it together in a way, in a prayer that's instructive, that teaches them, that guides them, that reminds them of all of what they know about who God is in one very compact place. And so I think that's why the Lord's Prayer resonates with us. We love to um, sing about it. We love to read it. We may love to pray it. it. It sets our minds in the right place because it picks up on so much richness from Scripture. From our Lord Jesus, I think we should expect nothing less. But turning back to Psalms here, let's look at 123 verse 2. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of of a maid to the hand of her mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. So here, um, just as in Psalm 121, we see the psalmist again, beginning with the pronoun you, um, describing a little bit further you who dwell in the heavens. Okay, so who are we talking about? Um, you as the one who um, there's this concept of neediness, of looking to the hand of guidance and provision, and then there it is. It's like setting the stage and then boom, at the end of verse 2, to Jehovah, Yahweh, our God. So there's this buildup and this anticipation of who are we talking about? Here he is. And Psalm 121 contains this same literary device. It creates suspense by waiting to reveal the great name. Um, I, I love the song. Uh, Natalie Grant has a song, Your Great Name. And it is the name of God that is so powerful and to which we attribute so much. And what this verse, verse 2, describes is a believing and humble heart of one who is looking away from people, away from circumstances, and is able to focus in exclusively on the Lord God. It's the idea of the lower looking to the higher, depending on the one who is above. And this illustration, you think of it as someone who is a servant, is generally someone who um, doesn't have probably a lot of means, uh, can't do a lot to help themselves, is very reliant on, you know, I guess maybe a, a modern context would be more of like an employer relationship or maybe a landlord relationship or, or something to this effect of someone who you look to to provide in some way what you need. Maybe, uh, an easy example, I think, for us in our day and context is um, benefits, right? Jobs, I, I've stayed on jobs for years because of the benefits because they, they're important to your um, existence and your family's existence. And so this psalmist is looking in that same way to the Lord, basically saying uh, the provision that's handed from the Lord, I, I'm focusing on that hand of provision. You also may think of it as um, 
the hand being the hand of direction, of guidance. And so it's just this um, anticipation, this humility, and looking to the Lord for everything. And this speaks volumes. Let's look at verse 3. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. The, the word repeats, have mercy on us, um, Jehovah. Have mercy on us or um, show favor to us. And again, using his personal covenant name, why? Why, why is this so critical? Why is this such a um, dangerous or uh, bad situation for this psalmist to be in? It says, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Um, so it's also interesting how here in between verses 1 and verse 3, there's this transition that happens in verse 2 from the singular to the plural. The psalmist begins by saying I, and then by this point it begins to move into we. And I don't know the exact nuances of this. I've, I've kind of rolled this around a few times and I'm not entirely certain, but it seems to be an expansion that the psalmist is describing his own journey, but then applying it to his countrymen, following the pattern of the preceding psalm, Psalm 122, and saying basically we're all in this together, that we're all striving together, we're having a hard time together, we're facing things together, and we're crying out to the Lord together. So it's a, a camaraderie, a, a unif unifying effect that it has. What is the psalmist crying out for? God's mercy or God's favor? Speaking to his supremacy over all things and the refuge that he provides from, and then there it's spelled out, contempt. Great contempt. And then we're going to see and scoffing as well. It's probable that this psalm may, may well have been written, and it's kind of my feeling on it, but I can't back it up explicitly, that this may have been written during post-exilic times, during the time that the exiles came back from captivity. You might remember if you've read the book of Ezra, that there was this plan in Ezra chapter 5 to rebuild the temple under Zerubbabel, and that the people began this building project. They wanted to have a place once again where they could worship the Lord. And they were met, though, with hatred, with opposition. They were met with arrogance and contempt and scoffing as they were beginning this work of trying to rebuild the temple. They were just trying to get back on their feet. They were just trying to scrape things back together. And yet they were being opposed the entire time. And so we recall, though, that every step of the way, God was helping them. God was um, thwarting those that would try to stop the progress. God was helping make it possible for them to continue, that God was showing them his favor. But the, the opposition, what were they doing? Well, they were being contemptuous, and they were also at ease. They didn't have any hardship. They didn't have anything that was weighing on them, and it made them easy to be arrogant, but God was not with them. God was with the, the strugglers. God was with the ones that were um, seeking to do right, to rebuild, to work in a way to enable them to worship him, and he was with them. So we learn from that immediately that being at ease is not synonymous with God's favor that many times his favor goes directly with the struggle, and that it's through the struggle that we get to see him and draw near to him and see how he's working, and we pray the prayer of verse 3 for him to show favor on us in that. We, uh, we see God was with his own. He was protecting and helping them, and we also, in the next book of the Bible, Proverbs chapter 3, we read that he... Jehovah, the Lord, scoffs at the scoffers. I love that. He scoffs at the scoffers. Those that are quick to scoff at others, the Lord is scoffing at them. 
yet he gives grace to the afflicted. It says the wise will inherit honor, but fools display dishonor. That's, of course, picked up in James chapter 5 as well. So that brings us to our first takeaway this morning, and it's this one. The favor or mercy of God. In God's economy, we remember that everything is flipped on its head. Down is up and up is down, and we read that in the Sermon on the Mount, and, you know, blessed are the peacemakers, um, you know, blessed are those who mourn. Uh, it, it all just seems upside down, but that's the reality with God. We, um, we know that the, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. That when we take our stand with the Lord and we attach ourselves to him, the one who dwells in heaven, that he is greater than anyone on the earth. Additionally, as those who um, are walking with the Lord, we can expect to experience contempt from the arrogant. If we're walking in humility, expect contempt from those who are not humble. However, the greater our humiliation among people, the more we're reviled or laughed at or um, um, scoffed at or, or whatever, the more we can expect the Lord to work. That that's a short-term situation, that, but that greater vindication and exaltation awaits with God in the long term. God, it says in James, is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. Um, that, for me, is the, uh, really the epitome of what we see culturally going on right now as well that you think of the, the attempt to try to turn the month of June into Pride Month. And then now that's been attempting to be expanded into Pride Season. And I don't know what it's going to be after that, just like the whole Pride Year or something like that. But the focus on pride and being proud is not a biblical virtue. Um, so it is on that basis that I think we have a, a biblical uh, obligation to say no. Uh, that, that is not honoring to the Lord. Let's look at number, uh, verse 4. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorn of those who are at ease, with the contempt of the proud. James Boyce writes that the reason people ridicule others, the ones that they oppose, aside from it being so easy, is that it is demoralizing and frequently effective. It is effective because it strikes at the hidden insecurities or weaknesses that almost everybody has. So when people, um, when people engage in that, we're all necessarily vulnerable to that to one extent or another because we have insecurities and we think, well, you know, what if, what if that's right? Or, um, you know, yeah, maybe, maybe that is what they're saying is, is really the reality. Maybe that is who I am. Maybe, that's, um, maybe that is um, something that uh, is wrong with me or something like that. And I think maybe the younger you are, the, the more you are apt to um, struggle with that. Maybe as you get older, you, you get more confidence and such. But at any age, the remedy for this is to recognize that people engage in this, as Boyce says, as an easy uh, opportunity, a tactic, that it, it, it messes with others because of our inherent insecurities that we all have, but that we look to the Lord just as a psalm implores us to do, that even as others are um, scorning, even as they're arrogant and contemptuous, we look to the Lord. That's our next takeaway this morning, our sense of dependence on God. Just as this psalm in verse 2, it is necessary for us to have a sense of dependence on the Lord, like that, that servant looking to the hand of the master, the one who reigns supreme, the one who reigns supreme and who is supremely able in order for us to realize and I would say also recognize his help. That if, if we want to have God's help, we have to want his help. If we want to see what he can do to take care of us, we have to recognize that we're dependent on him. And he is infinitely able 
and capable and will respond. Let's look at our final one here this morning, number three. Oh, before we get there, this is, uh, I mentioned this last time, that there's all these words in Hebrew for to praise. I said, I, th- I think there's at least 17, and here's a, a list I put together. Um, amar, to, to say or to speak. Um, you can speak the Lord's praises. Barak, to bless, to extol. Basar, to proclaim. Gil, to rejoice. Halal, to praise. Yada, to give thanks. Uh, Ranan, to sing or to shout joyfully. Seer, to sing praises. Gedal, to magnify the greatness of. Room, um, to exalt, zamar, to sing, or especially in a musical context, to sing or to play musically in praise, uh, nagad, to declare, safar, to tell or to, to make known, to broadcast, dutz, to leap for joy, alats, to exult, to rejoice, ruah, to shout, um, that is to make a lot of noise, Sus, to rejoice, exult, dabar, to say, to speak it, and samach, to be glad and uh, to rejoice. There's actually 19 in, in the list there. Hebrew is a language of praise because God designed his people to be people of praise. Do you think that has any implications for us? And I think the implications and the application are rich, that this should be our heart as well. A truly worshipful heart, God's will for each of us is that whatever we are dealing with, like I said earlier, you know, maybe you're having a tough time. You're drained, you're, you're, you're fed up, you're feeling dried up, you're just barely making it, that we give it over to him. Knowing that he provides the answer, the solution, the, the favor, as this psalm says, to what's causing us so much trouble. Um, the psalmist is able to come to this by way of the fact that they, they're drawing near to the temple. They're drawing near to the place of worship, and they're declaring God's supremacy and greatness. Then, verse 2, declaring his dependence and trust in him and, and starting to expand it corporately, and finally crying out as a group, as a whole, for God's mercy because it feels like, you know, at, at a breaking point. And I think you, you, you package this all together, and it sets the very heart of worship. If you're coming up to Jerusalem to worship, what better place is there to start from than this standpoint of the reality that God is supreme, that I, I look up to the one who dwells in heaven, that um, I recognize my own dependence on him, just looking to his hand for his provision, and then presenting him with my troubles. And so whatever it is in this psalm, for this psalmist in 123, it's contempt. He's dealing with the contempt of arrogant people. Their lives are at ease. They're scornful, derisive, and he's just having a hard time with it. But our circumstances may be that, or they may be something different altogether. They could be unique to whatever it is that you are are enduring at a particular given time, but the remedy is the same. It is a heart of worship, of taking that to the Lord, of looking to the one who is over and above people and circumstances, knowing that he opposes those who are arrogant, he gives grace to those who are humble. That if you humble yourself before him, that if we come to him humbly and dependent and with a heart of worship, he will meet us there, and that is the absolute perfect, amazing point at which we come to worship the Lord. We'll conclude there for this morning. And with that, um, I'd like to ask uh, Heath to, to come on up and lead us in our final worship song this morning. And then after that, we'll have a special treat from the uh, Candles Club. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we will um, invite uh, the Candles Club to come on up. Let's, let's pray this morning. Father, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks for the freedom that we have. Lord, we have freedom 
uh, as a people, as a nation. And we give you thanks, Lord, that we're not under oppression and, uh, or slavery or other conditions, but Lord, we have um, the ability to be free. We thank you for all those that secured that freedom for us. Lord, we rejoice in freedom because it's a virtue that we look to of you. Lord, you are the God of liberation and freedom, and you liberated us through your Son, Jesus Christ. You gave us freedom from sin and sin's penalty, and we are no longer slaves to sin. Lord, we pray that you would um, enable us to just implement the, the words and the uh, the principles found in this psalm we've studied this morning, Lord, that we would draw near to you, that we would have a heart of worship, and that we would um, cherish each thing that you give to us, that you provide for us, and help us to draw our focus upward to the God who is over and above all and who reigns supreme and who is capable of all. Lord, I ask that you would bless and keep each one here, and um, Lord, may we just enjoy the, the holiday and the celebration together with friends and family. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.